This is Jordan Poyer, safety for the Buffalo Bills, and you are now listening to Cover One Buffalo Podcast. Let's go. Good evening and welcome to the Cover One Buffalo Podcast. You are joining your host, Greg Thompson, along with his partner in crime, Aaron Quinn. Aaron, how are we doing? Today's been a great day, man. We are going to get into a bunch of it, but uh, you had a fantastic day. I heard on Twitter that you had a great day, uh, and I had a great day because two of the things that I've wanted the most, one that I knew was going to happen today, and then one that I've just been waiting for it to happen today, uh, or waiting for it to happen, happen. So great day. I'm enjoying a beer, and I'm glad that I, we picked today to have a, a conversation. So I think this is going to be a fun show, man. Absolutely. And it's brought to you by our partners, Uncle Jumbos. Uh, make sure you're going over to check them out at UncleJumbosDistillery.com. Today is absolutely a day to pour yourself a wonderful blueberry lemonade or, or a nice just clean glass of vodka. It's just delightful. And today is a great day to celebrate. And we're going to jump right into it because the reason to celebrate isn't necessarily who made the roster, which we'll get to. And, you know, maybe some surprising cuts and who made the team. Your man, Tredavious White, was extended to a record-setting deal. I'm going to step away and let you just bask in the glory of the guy you've talked about since the moment he walked in the door. Well, you're going to get your glory here in a little bit, but I will I will step into the fold here and take it because honestly, I've loved Trey Davies since I didn't know a ton about him in that first draft process. But when Eric and, and back then Rob Quinn was working with us and we started breaking him down and I was taking a look at this guy. I'm a big defensive back guy. I love defensive backs. I pride myself as that's probably the position I know the best. And I started watching this guy and thinking, man, this kid's going to be special. I, my floor for him when I talked to friends was this guy's floor is, you know, uh, maybe Leotis McKelvin. It would be his floor, a good starter for his whole career. I didn't even know as much as I was into him how good he, this guy was going to be. Uh, he has been the best football player since the day he walked into one Bills drive. And I've every year we do the the final show on locker room clean out day and we talk about our MVP for the season. The last two years in a row, I've picked Trey White. And I don't think it's just me standing for him and just being a fanboy. I think that there's a good case that he's been the best football player since he arrived here in Buffalo. And more importantly than that, he does everything the right way. When Sean McDermott and Brandon Bean talk about the process, I mean, Tredavious White is cut. He's the cookie cutter of the process. He th- puts in the work. He has fun doing it. He's a good guy. He just follows all the rules. He is a team guy. Fun to be around. You see him on Instagram. You see him on all the Bills media. He's always just having a good time. Loves football. If you're a fan of football and you have the game pass, I urge you to go watch Tredavious White's breakdown with uh, Kurt Warner and Brian Baldinger. The way his eyes light up when he talks about football, and and you can just tell this guy's wired differently, and he is the process. And for them to make the type of commitment they made for him, and that was a great deal for the Bills. Don't get you'll get to talking about that. This is a great deal for the Bills, but they made a big commitment in the in Tredavious White. For them to do that shows that hey. This is a guy we brought in. This is a guy who's done everything we've asked. He's lived up to the process. He's done every single set the standard in this building every day. We're going to give him the money that he deserves because that's what we do. We draft our talent. And if you provide to us, we're going to provide to you. And that sets a standard, not just with the players on this roster, league wide. This is a different run organization for the Bills. I think we were talking a little bit off air here. This might be the most important Bills signing since sometime in the 90s. I mean, this is a big one. This sets the culture. This sets the table for this team moving forward. Uh, and I'll hand the floor back to you because you've got some bat- back padding uh, to do yourself to here tonight. Uh, so I, I did put out a tweet back in March that pegged the deal at five years and $82 million. And that's what it came in at. So I, I was, I, uh, when it comes to math, I, I, I do get it pretty close here. Uh, so I'll walk through the details, but I, I just want to tag on a little bit of what you were saying. The fact that they showed, we've talked about this a couple times, that you can get drafted by this team, come and buy in in every way, play your tail off, and then be made the highest paid player at your position in NFL history is awesome. I love that those tweets went out all over the place today about Trey White is the highest paid cornerback in NFL history. That's awesome. Now, the sneaky part is they got to send out those tweets. Trey gets that 
pat on the back. And they did it before Jalen Ramsey and before Marlon Humphrey and before Marcus Lattimore and all those other guys who are now just going to one up him by 250, 500,000 a year until somebody gets 20 million. And instead we got to lock him in at 17.5. It's fantastic. So just run through the details real quick here. Trey is under contract in 2020 for about two and a half million dollars. His fifth year option is already in place for 2021 at about $10.1 million. Then they add for years at 70 million which is about 17.5 it's actually 69 million nice that is with a one-year escalator if he makes the pro bowl which of course he's going to make the pro bowl he's all um, pro yeah so it's going to make it to 70 million so they get him for six years 2020 2021 2022 2023 2024 2025 six years yeah. our most talented player is locked up on this roster it is absolutely fantastic i was hedging I, I was being hopeful and I had a lot of people call me out that my number was way too low and I I was a little concerned with it like as you see some of these other things come out heck the the Chargers gave Bosa 25 27 million a year I'm like oh my gosh corners are gonna cost like 22 or 23 million and it's gonna and it was fine it, it, whatever it took to keep Trey White we needed to do but the fact that Brandon Bean did this for I'll say conservatively three million a year lower than what it could have been, but potentially five million a year lower than what it could have been. Um, I, I believe it was our friend Nate Geary who put out the tweet saying that this value of what they got below market is just extra money into Matt Milano's coffers to be able Absolutely. to make it easier to keep him. So, you know, we were talking off air about the kind of people you think back to that Thanksgiving Day game, all the people on this roster. All the leaders and the the leadership council that McDermott talks about, what family did they show welcoming America's team and the Bills to Thanksgiving? It was Tredavious White at home with his wife and his kids representing the team and the franchise. I said it afterwards, half tongue-in-cheek, but half serious. That's the kind of thing that makes me think there's no chance he's leaving. This is the guy they're going to invest in, and they're going to make him the highest-paid corner in NFL history, and they did it in the smartest way possible. Yeah, and a little bit, you know, to the point you're making, yes, he got paid, but I think a lot of fans worried whether it was uh, from social media interactions with fans or some of the things that he said in the past or kind of every offseason he takes down all Cleans the out of Instagram. <laughs> yeah, he takes all stuff down. Everybody's like, oh, he hates Buffalo. He doesn't want to be here. I think that the, you know, accepting a deal that he knows he could have got more money yes. than that. And if he, he would have played out his contract, he would have gotten way more money than that. I think it goes to show what he thinks of this team, what he thinks of Sean McDermott, what they're doing. And I, I think that he knows part of the process of to get where they want to go is to get Matt Milano some money and get him signed along too, because he's a smart player. He's a mature player for his age. He knows what is happening here. He knows this defense is special and they've been keeping this defense together. I always get very concerned about when you have a good defense and the offense doesn't quite live up to what they need to do. It's really difficult to have a top tier defense multiple years in a row. The only way you can do it is continuity. And I know yeah. radio guys hate that term and Twitter guys, they hate that term continuity, but that is really the only way to keep a top tier, top five, six defense three years in a row is to bring back the same guys. And if you lose Trey in a couple of years, you're really uh, give it, digging yourself a hole that's hard to get. You're not going to hit on a Trey White in the draft every once in a while. I mean, this this guy is a rare type of player. He's up there in his first three years. He's being talked about with Stephon Gilmore as, you know, who's number one? It's one A and B is so. the best quarter, cornerbacks in the entire league. So uh, this is fantastic. I'm so happy. I'm ordering a Trey White jersey tonight because – He's going to be, you just said yeah. it, man. We got six more years to just enjoy phenomenal cornerback play. And if, if you haven't really watched the intricacies of how he plays, go back in the vault and watch some of the stuff that Eric put out when he first drafted him. I mean, the guy is a technician. Go watch that game day, that game pass yeah. clip with Baldinger and uh, Kurt Warner. He's just, he loves the game. He's a technician. He's so much fun to watch. And it's unfortunate you don't get to watch really in the game view on the broadcast. View. You don't get to see the work he yeah. does. I know Eric and, and you and I last year had to really defend Tredavious White against uh, nonsense attacks of him losing a step and him maybe not being that good. And you know, we can't give this guy that much money. And, 
nonsense. You can't see that in the broadcast. When you watch him on Game Pass, like, he's a phenomenal player, and he really does a lot to help this defense. And I can't wait to see it, man. Can't wait to see it for six more years. Absolutely. Hey, a lot of great comments here. War Code Red, you're not alone, man. I, I was petrified. That's what we've been beaten yeah. into submission for. We, we watched our best players leave to get paid somewhere else because we were either too cheap or they didn't want to sign here. Um, same thing. Uh, Adam Ritter talking about you know the first first rounder to be extended what seems like forever. It's because it has been forever. Or yeah. the one that we did was Marcel Darius, which was yeah, now that guy. decision. <laughs> so yeah, the the only time we got him to do it is because we massively overpaid. Yeah. Um, and Sonny's spot on. Well, I, I hope that they extend Brandon Bean here literally it's tomorrow. Coming. Like I'm not even exaggerating. I hope it's tomorrow, and I predict it will be before kickoff. I think that we have a Brandon Bean extension before kickoff of Week One. Yeah, he's not worried about it. It's coming. He knows it's coming. He he's done the work. I think everybody in the building has tons of respect for him. But yeah, I, I think you're you're. Right. I think he wanted to get this Trey White deal done before that. I know people wanted it following the McDermott news, but I think he wanted to get that one done. I'm, I bet Milano's not far off. I think they'll take a the little bit of time with that because they have some cushion with Milano deal. Uh, but I think he wants to take care of business. That binder that he yeah. is always talked about, what they had planned. Uh, 2020 was the year, man. I think he wants to finish the work and then pay me. That's the kind of guy Brandon Bean is. Yeah, Adam asking here to break down the Milano probability. I'm going to say that it's it's better than 50-50, but it's not 90-10. It's not a slam dunk. I think it's more likely to happen than not. I've been projecting it the whole time at 13 million, three years, 39 million. I'd be lying if I said that Zach Cunningham deal at 14 and a half didn't freak me out a little bit. Um, you know, if that's what it takes and that takes you to three years, 43 and a half million, then that's what it takes. You know, I, I still want him here. It makes it a little tougher. Um, that makes it a little tighter. Um, I think there's some t- some players. We'll talk about it when we get to the worst thing you missed on Twitter this week at the end of the, the show. Um, people have been talking about guys to get cut or traded next year and things like that. What you have to keep in mind is you can also extend them and yeah. decrease their cap number next year. They did that with the Deion Dawkins deal. I wouldn't be, you know, they they were smart about this and gave Trey a lot of extra money. None of it kicks in next year. It's after the fifth year extension. So there's a lot of good stuff. Um, obviously, check it out in the in the chat here. Iron Eagle sharing the link of that uh, uh, breakdown with Brian Baldinger. Great job, man. Appreciate it. Um, but yeah, I think that it's still more likely than not that we see uh, Matt Milano. I'm still going to hold true to my number at three years, 39 million. I think that's what he gets. And seeing Trey not necessarily milk every dollar on the open market makes me feel a little bit better about sticking to that number. 13 million a year is a hell of a lot of money yeah. for an off ball linebacker, and Milano would be happy to get it. And to, I'm not a money guy. I don't know the value. I trust you. you the, the record speaks for itself now, and I hate how right you are sometimes. Uh, it drives me nuts. But uh, I'll go with it. And the other thing you do have to think, I, I think Milano knows that some of his value is being in this defense. I think some of his, he knows some of his value is being with Babbage. Some of his value is going to be staying with Tremaine Edmonds. Some of his that value is going to be staying with the continuity that we're talking about. He's, he's got probably more value here than he does in some other places. He could probably go get a little bit more and milk something somewhere else, but he, he might be the kind of guy that goes somewhere else and goes into a defense that maybe isn't the best fit and kind of, kind of falls off or he can stay here build something special. And I I think he cares about that. The bills took a chance on Matt Milano when they got him and moved him to linebacker and brought him in. And he's a really good fit here. And he's a smart football player. And like you said, that 13 million is not nothing. That's going to make him a very comfortable man to cut play football at a place that he's comfortable playing. So I think some of that stuff does matter. And the older players get into their career, it matters more and more. And you heard from Sarah Neal the other day. I think the guys in this locker room feel like this is really close. And I know guys in the locker room say it all the time. Oh, this team, you know, we can win it this year. It, when his eyes lit up and he said, I think we got something special and we can do something really good here. I think that is probably around the entire room on that defense, at least, and, and probably in the entire locker room. So I know people say that stuff doesn't matter and guys just want to get paid, but I think you saw it a little bit with Trey White, and I think that you might see it again with Matt Milano, where a big contract like Cunningham, yeah, I could get that money, but you know what? I'm going to take 
what I can get here and stay here and, and, and make a real run at this. Absolutely. Uh, Juan, make it a kind of, if other channels are talking about Milano leaving, tell them that I told you to tell them that they're full of nonsense and tomfoolery. That's, that's crazy. Um, if you guys think <laughs> I'm good with numbers and to think Brandon Bean is a financial genius, literally yeah. like he is a financial genius. He is fantastic in the terms of every single contract that we sign, how team friendly it is, what, f- what flexibility it gives guys like John Brown and stuff on digs we can work with their numbers next year to extend them and decrease their cap number there's plenty of ways to be able to keep them there so um some other questions that we're going to get to here about dean marlowe and some of the other cuts and how they're going to make that work we're going to jump right into that now well and into that i was going to say i was having a talk with my our buddy uh pat moran of the of his podcast there and we were talking about my buddy Trent Murphy, who I'm not on Twitter anymore, but I've been pounding the table on the Slack channel for Trent Murphy. And everybody was telling me and all the tweets were saying like, oh, if you if you bring him on, if you keep him on the 53, you're not going to be able to get Trey White and Milano done. And I was talking to Pat today and I said, man, people on Twitter are saying that, but I trust Brandon Bean. He can work this out. I'm not worried about Brandon Bean being able to make those numbers work or whip some deals around. I think he can get them both back and keep Trent Murphy and. I th- I'm not saying we're definitely going to keep Milano, but it's looking that way. And my boys on the 2020 roster for now. Absolutely. Speaking of which, let's dive right in. A uh, little bit boring part, but we're going to go through position by position. Uh, maybe some surprises, maybe some things that popped up. Um, I'll start at quarterback um, where maybe a mild a surprise. Little surprise. I projected that Jake Fromm would get cut. Obviously, Josh Allen and Matt Barkley were stone cold locks. A lot of people were saying that Davis Webb was the more likely third quarterback if they kept a third quarterback. Um, I'm going to say that it was simply the draft investment, and I'll get to it later on when I project where I think this second magical IR spot is coming from. Um, but I, Davis Webb is going to be a priority on the practice squad, but I was mildly surprised with Jake Fromm. Yeah, I was surprised. I figured he was a cut. The, here's the hard thing with quarterbacks is we didn't see anything except for reports about Allen. We saw a couple balls from Matt Barkley in some of the highlight videos, but that was even limited. So for anyone to feel like they could make any type of evaluation of Webb or from besides their own biases going into camp about from, uh, I, I don't think that that is accurate at all. So we just have to trust that they, like you said, it's either the draft investment or they saw something. They said, Hey, you know what? We, this is a developmental guy that we can work with. And you know what? Honestly, if we're, if we're playing either one of them, Davis or from things have gone terribly wrong yeah. <laughs> and I don't even care. You know anyway, guys are in the game. It's yeah. Like, I don't want, I don't really, want to... really right. If it's week 17, yeah, again, sure. The, the Dolphins went really right. Sure. But I don't know that there's a huge substantial difference between the two guys. So if it comes down to, Hey, this is a younger guy we can develop. Sure. I don't, I don't care, but yeah, I thought he was going to be, it was a bit of a surprise for sure. Yeah. Um, running back was probably one of the easiest ones to see coming here. Singletary, Moss, Yeldon, and Jones. Um, I went out on a limb and thought that maybe the Antonio Williams re-signing was a trigger that Yeldon might get cut, but I, I was, you know, trying to take a stab at something a little outside out of the box there. This is the more likely scenario. So Singletary, Moss, Yeldon, Taiwan Jones, pretty straightforward. Antonio Williams and Christian Wade are probably both reasonable practice squad candidates, but no surprises there. No, uh, I'm a huge Taiwan Jones stan, so I'm happy to see him uh, back on this roster. But yeah, no no big surprises there. And I, I'd like to see those guys back on the practice squad because I think it, you can't have enough backs in the practice squad. Somebody's going to go down throughout the year and you might have to activate somebody. So uh, it's good to have young talent around. And uh, so, yeah, no big surprises. So wide receiver, and this is a good one. We had some people asking about the Marlowe situation, and I'll kind of answer it here along with Andre Roberts. So at wide receiver, we saw six, which is what everybody projected, but it was surprising what the six names were. So it's Stefan Diggs, John Brown, Cole Beasley, Gabe Davis. Everybody had those. Then we had little Isaiah and big Isaiah. So Isaiah McKenzie and Isaiah Hodgins with Andre Roberts getting cut for the brief, like six minute period before the news broke, Twitter lost their minds because, Oh my gosh, what are we doing? He was a roster lock. Who, who is even going to return cut return kicks? And then the news came out that, well, he's actually the easiest one to be able to get back on the team after players get IR. So, let me explain that. The same thing. Andre Roberts and Dean Marlowe both got released. 
both of them are going to be on this roster for the whole season. The reason they got released is because they were close to the minimum. It actually helps a little bit with Andre Roberts. who It actually saved a little bit of money. I wouldn't be surprised if they gave him most of it back tomorrow. Um, but Andre Roberts and Dean Marlowe are vested veterans. Once you get past your fourth year in the league, you are now a vested veteran. When you get released, you go straight to being a free agent. If you're within those first four years, you have to go through waivers, and any other team can claim you. So Isaiah McKenzie and Isaiah Hodgins or Jaquan Johnson or Saran Neal or any other player competing with Andre Roberts or Dean Marlowe, if we cut them, they would get exposed to waivers. And then we'd have to hope that they didn't get picked up by somebody else. Um, Another player like that is also could have been someone like Evan Bain. Uh, was another player that was a veteran minimum. He hasn't been reported that he's coming back, but he was also eligible for that same thing where you're already close to the minimum. If we cut you today and give you back that same money on Monday, it doesn't really hurt you. And they did this with Kurt Coleman last year. So they kept Jason Kroon, pushed him onto the IR, brought back Kurt Coleman the next day, gave him a nice $100,000 signing bonus for being a good soldier and going along with it. Andre Roberts and Dean Marlowe are going to get the same thing. They'll give him a little bit of cash to be like, hey, thanks for playing along with us and letting us do this roster shuffling shuffling yeah um so it's going to be seven receivers it's going to be Diggs, brown beasley gabe davis Isaiah mckenzie i'm going to guess Isaiah hodgins is going to be a game day inactive most of the year and andre roberts will be back returning kicks yeah i it was a surprise that that tweaking happened um i didn't roberts wasn't what i projected to do it with sure but it makes sense the way you explain it now um mckenzie was one that i I saw a lot of people saying he was definitely going to make it. He's that big part of that jet sweep thing that Dable wants to have in this offense. I know Eric uh, often talks about how electric he is. And I agree when the ball is in his hands, he's super electric. I just really thought from the limited that we saw in camp, the amount they were using on Andre Roberts at wide receiver. And it was something the three of us were sitting at camp a year ago, watching Andre Roberts catch balls over the middle and use some of that jet sweep stuff. I would love in an ideal world if he could be those two roles in one. They still don't feel confident in that or comfortable with that. I'll do a draft time next spring. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I was hoping they would. Uh, so to see McKenzie make it was not necessarily a surprise, but it was something that I kind of, I didn't think he was going to make it through this team uh, on the 53 this year. Duke Williams was one that I was pretty confident he was not going to make it. He's a guy I know that I think a lot of people felt because I put out a bunch of Zay Jones stuff before he got cut that I was against Duke Williams. Uh, but it was more of the traditional how I feel of pump the brakes. Like yeah. this guy, you know, he is what he is. I think he can be a, a good wide receiver. I think somebody will pick him up if we don't get him back on the practice squad. I think there's a team for him that he can play on. But I think uh, his catch percentage was not fantastic Um, and that's what he was supposed to be he was supposed to be the anti zay jones who was going to come in and catch everything he made some really nice grabs some contested balls in traffic uh but he was not a consistent he was less consistent than dawson knox and everybody was pissed about dawson dawson knox a year ago so um he had an uphill battle to really get back on this team this year and then once davis took off in camp he was done that took his role and so see it's thank you duke for what you did do while you're here but uh you know if you get on back back on the practice squad fantastic if not good luck to you yeah same thing if if he signs off with another team who's going to give him an active game day roster spot god bless him he deserves congratulations he's fought for it this is the good kind of problems that brandon bean has brought brought us that if robert foster and duke williams catch on somebody or somewhere else that's great. I, I, I'm, I have no ill will. I wish them all the best, and I'm going to root for them every game they're not playing the Bills. Yeah. Um, you, you didn't mention Robert Foster. Also, there were some rumors they were trying to move him via trade. I, to be completely honest, I saw no trades today. I, I was scouring and refreshing Twitter by the second. I saw no trades across the league. So I'm really I'm going to read into that and assume that we're also not going to see a bunch of stealing um, of claims across the board either i think people want their own guys back and just to get into the season and play football now not none we're going to see some claims but i think i I put out a tweet before last year cut down day there were 33 across the whole league it was 2.7 percent um i'm expecting low percentage again i think there's going to be somewhere between 20 and 50 claims everybody's going to move on maybe one or two of the guys we talk about here get released but that's about it 
Every year we go through this. I'm <laughs> so it really is frustrating because every year we go through, oh, we can't expose this guy to waivers. And yes, it does happen. Uh, 33% of the time last year it happened. It does happen, but I think fans of every fan base, my brother's a, a talk about it all the time. He's a Chicago Bears and he does podcasts and their team's the same way. And all my Patriots friends are the same way. They have five or six guys on their team that everybody likes and falls in love with the camp. And they're all terrified that everybody else in the league is going to take their guy. And it very, very rarely happens. I do think Robert Foster is an interesting candidate for that because if it wasn't for the amount of talent that they've brought in specifically to help on special teams here throughout the last couple of years, they've got some studs on special teams. If it wasn't cuttable as a gunner is great. Yes. And he played very well. He almost kept Duke Williams off the field for the entire, because of how well he was playing on special teams, not because of how good of a wide receiver he was. So if any of these guys uh, are probably candidates to get claimed, I think it would be Robert Foster just for a special teams ability. If somebody was really looking not from out there or he's done a really good job on teams, but with COVID and the protocols and stuff, that's going to be also additionally hard this year, even though, like I said, 33% a year ago, I think it could probably be even less this year with COVID of having to get a guy in, get him under all the protocols. He might not even be ready for week one at that point. It's going to be a really tough year for some of the guys that got cut. I think a lot of guys are coming back to practice squads. Yeah. So the next spot is coming in at tight end. And this one was a mild surprise. So obviously three pretty easy ones, Dawson Knox, Tyler Croft, Lee Smith, the way that they structured Tyler Croft and Lee Smith's contracts, there were really no benefit to cutting them. Tommy Sweeney's moving on to pup. Again, we explained that in the last show, if a player has not passed their physical and did not practice in during training camp, you can carry them over to the physically unable to perform list without exposing them to waivers. So Tommy Sweeney does not count against the 53 man roster. He's also not, now at not eligible to return until after week six. So Tommy Sweeney's on pup week seven or beyond. He's a potential opportunity. And then Reggie Gilliam. And I've gone bananas explaining to people that from the moment he signed, he was a fullback H back move tight end special teams guy. No matter what you list him, he's not one thing. So when people were talking about, Oh my gosh, they moved him from fullback to tight end. That's such a huge move and means this now. No, it didn't. He, if they listed him at fullback, he was never only a fullback. If they list him at tight end, he was never only a tight end. He's the same guy he was the whole time. I honestly think if Patrick DeMarco stayed healthy, he would have been cut and would have been on the practice squad. I don't know that he beat out Patrick DeMarco, but with that neck injury, they had to put him on season ending IR. So um, I'm excited. Uh, Reggie Gilliam runs a four five eight forty, and Patrick DeMarco ran a four nine five. I like that athleticism. I think that's a benefit on special teams. I'm curious what we see from him and where it could go, but he's, and I brought it up before, He's kind of the skill set of Charles Clay with functioning knees, and that's an exciting uh, probability. Yeah, no, you were very passionate about that. You were almost yelling at me in, in a chat earlier. I think you were just defensive of arguing about that on, on probably the Twitter box a little bit. But, uh, yeah, no, I was a little bit bummed to see DeMarco end up on the IR. I kind of assumed it was a situation where they – Hey, we know what you got. You're a little banged up. Take your time. Come back. There's a spot for you. Apparently, it's more serious than that. Um, and I feel bad for Demarco because that could probably be it for him yeah. uh, in, in his career. That's a tough injury. Neck injury is a tough one to get over, especially at his age. He's yeah, already kind of taken a step back athletically. He wasn't a super athletic guy to begin with, so uh, tough break for him. I'm, I'm excited to see what this guy offers. I haven't gotten to read. Uh, Eric's got an article uh, up about breaking down what kind of role he can have on this team. I haven't gotten a chance to read that yet today, but uh, that's probably something I'm going to check out tonight. Cause I really don't know much about Gillum and I'm, I'm interested to see how they're going to use him, how they're going to get work him in. I'm, I'm going to assume it's going to be pretty limited uh, for most of the season here, but it'll be interesting. And that type of athleticism, who knows uh, what, what you can do. And I, I mean, I thought Dawson Ox was going to be super limited a year ago and he had a, a big role in this offense. Uh, so I, I'm interested to see how that plays out. And uh, yeah, I think I do agree with you. I think you got his, more of his opportunity due to DeMarco's injury than necessarily his own play. So we'll, we'll see how he develops. Yeah. So moving on to the next piece of it, and I, I know I've had a couple of different questions here. Um, it, this is going to help explain a piece of it and it's with the offensive line. So as the offensive line comes in, it's going to be able to set up that we have 10 initially. So Mitch Morse, Deion Dawkins, Quentin Spain, Cody Ford, John Feliciano, last five starters, last year's five starters, Ty and Brian winners, then Ryan Bates, 
Ike Botker, and Daryl Williams. That's 10. So I know uh, Joe Smith was uh, commenting on a couple uh, things here. They're actually not going to have to cut anyone. So the reason they're not going to have to cut anyone to bring back Marlon Roberts is because they're going to use the injured reserve. So John Feliciano will get put on injured reserve tomorrow. And then they get a free spot to be able to bring somebody back. The reason they had to do it in that order, you had Patrick DeMarco get uh, put on IR yesterday. That ended his whole season. He is not eligible to return. If a player makes the 53-man roster and then gets put on IR, they're eligible to come back after only three weeks. That's a rule just for 2020 because of COVID, but they're going to certainly take advantage of that. So going through here, uh, Andre Roberts and Dean Marlowe are not signing anywhere. It's already been reported that they will re-sign tomorrow. We'll get to that in a minute. There's a mystery second IR person that I don't know who it is. I'm going to project that all of a sudden Jake Fromm needs to get put on the IR. And it's similar to last year where Voshan Joseph all of a sudden needed to get put on IR, and it was really a stash for the season. Um I have no idea. I don't know of any other player that has an obvious enough injury that they need to be out for three weeks plus. Um, So short of something we don't know about Josh Norman or Levi Wallace, they were technically on the injury report. I'm going to project that all of a sudden magically Jake Fromm has some tendonitis in his shoulder and needs to get put on IR. And then all of a sudden we hide him there because he now made the roster and he's not out, not uh, open to waivers, but a second guy is going to be there. So we don't actually need to cut anyone that it's been reported that there's going to be two IR moves um, Feliciano is the easiest one. I don't know what the other one is, but once those happen, you then don't need to cut anyone. You can bring back Andre Roberts and Dean Marlowe. The one opportunity could be is if we claim somebody else. So if there is a player that we want from another team, that's where you'd get into, is it Reggie Gilliam or is it another lower end of the roster guy like we might talk about in a bit here. But on the offensive line, um, I, I was maybe I had projected Evan Bame would make it over Ike Botker. He's a guy who could be brought back. Um, I, I didn't see a ton of surprises there. I I had it at 10 and then, uh, Feliciano getting put on IR to come and back, bring it back to nine. Any surprises on the offensive line for you? No, I not surprises. I think the biggest problem for me is some of the fan thinking of, I, I think a lot of people didn't like winters coming yeah. into, I think they wanted to see him cut, which I, I'm not a big fan of. Him. I'm not going to pound the table for him, but a guy with as many snaps as he has, I think that that's really important to also a fully guaranteed contract, a fully guaranteed contract. Yeah. Financial, I, yeah. financial benefit to gotten him. Yeah. And you might need him this year. Let's be honest. We might have to have him coming in spots and then the love for Ryan Bates. <laughs> uh, it drives honestly like, and I, I don't like to come down on players. I don't, I'm not one of those guys that says players suck or anything like that. Uh, but Bates, I, he's not very good at football. I'm not going to say he sucks, but I don't want to see him play on this offensive line in 2020. I really don't. I don't understand the I love for it. Here. You made a perfect analogy. I've joked all the time that, hey, playing all five positions is great, but if you suck at all of them, what does it matter? Yeah. You made a perfect analogy that he's like a dull Swiss Army knife. It sounds good in theory. It's cool. I got all these things I can but use. You, you don't ever want to actually use it. For I don't want to cut a rope with a dull Swiss Army army knife and yeah no i don't get it the the team sees something in them so maybe i'm wrong i've been wrong before they and he was a rookie him. undrafted free agent last year yeah. so if you're gonna have a guy step forward and improve this is when he would do it so he certainly has that potential the versatility is great but <laughs> but like people talking like oh we stole this talent from the eagles like come on let's Pump the brakes a little bit like this guy. He go watch Eric watched it back again. Go watch him back again and see how he performed when he has Anytime played. He was on the field. He's a liability. It's not very good. Um, so yeah, seeing him is a little weird to me. I think he, I felt like he could have probably been a practice squad guy, but who knows? Maybe it was just a number. There wasn't enough guys and they wanted to keep the 10. So, uh, we'll see. But I, I like this group, man. It was something that we haven't had. We talked about it last year of, uh, you know, going from the 2018 team where things were just really bad to uh, improving to a mediocre unit last year. Now I really like the depth of the, this oh, yeah. offensive line. I'm a little concerned if something happens to Mitch Morris. I don't know what's going to happen while Feliciano's out. I, I don't love the options at center right now. If that goes out where, oh, no, where no, no. don't even say that. Yeah. When Feliciano is in, I, I 
I feel much better because I, I do think Feliciano can step in and be an okay center. So I'm, I'm hoping at least till he gets back, Mitch Morris is just wrapped in a bubble and uh, having a fantastic time. Uh, quick question here. Uh, Iron Eagle asks, is there a limit on how many players? The last couple of years, it's been two players. And after eight weeks this year, there was an exception. Uh, Joseph chimed in. IR has no limits. That is just for 2020, but that's correct. There's no limits for 2020. Um, and the, it, I, that is supposed to go back to normal next year. We'll see. I think if teams like it a lot, they may leave this more flexible to be able to use it. But um, it is just uh, uh, three after three weeks and no limit for the 2020 season. All right, we've reached the moment where we're going to talk about the defensive ends. If you have room, you can take a quick victory lap. Jerry Hughes, Mario Addison, A.J. Epinesa, Daryl Johnson, and Trent Murphy. Five defensive ends. Trent Murphy made this roster because he's good at football. Yeah, he is. I didn't. I never saw it. I never saw him getting cut. I, I guess if there was a good enough trade out there, I'm sure they they fielded calls for Trent Murphy. I know that the rumors were probably out there on Twitter, so they were probably out there within teams that this guy could be cut. And I'm sure they made calls. They probably didn't get a, a good enough value for him. He's a productive player. Go back and watch. He's a good player. He's not a perfect player. Maybe he's not living up to the contract that fans think he should be living up to it. It's not that bad of a contract to be honest all those guys uh addison oh yeah hughes murphy are all right there in the same area and and hugh and murphy at the end of the year was one of the most productive defensive linemen we had on this team so uh i love it um i know people said well you know addison can come in and he took a lot of snaps last year for carolina he could take the snaps from murphy it's not about that i, I think they yeah. brandon bean's been very specific since he got here they sign a lot of defensive linemen every year he's been here and he said if i could have 10 15 of these guys that i can just rotate all the time that's what i want i want talented guys i can rotate all year it's a position that guys wear down at it's a position that you're just you're going all the time i want guys you, you can rotate and that's what we have this is a very deep unit i'm i'm not a big fan of daryl johnson same thing with ryan bates you know i think mark ryan's gonna kill me uh or a member of our slack channel is gonna kill me when he hears this but i, I think he can be a fine special teams sure. contributor but I'm very happy that Trent Murphy also made. I know as soon as Daryl Johnson was announced that he was going to make the team, it got a little iffy. I won't lie. I got a little nervous throughout the day that maybe that was Trent's, uh, a bad signal for Trent, but I love this depth at defensive end. And I love that Jerry Hughes is going to be fresh legs all day. I love that Mario Addison at his age, these guys are, are at the wrong side of 30. And so to have some fresh legs to just rotate all season long is just a mwah, fantastic job by Brandon Bean putting that together. Well, people talk about it as though it was an accident or that Brian, Brandon Bean didn't know that Trent Murphy led the defensive line in snaps last year. He's well aware. So, yeah, bringing in Mario Addison, it's not an either-or thing. You want to know what? We don't want anybody to play 65% of the snaps. Mm -hmm. We want all of them at 56 58 50%. I would love it if Trent Murphy is just a luxury playing 40 45% of the snaps. It would be fantastic if A.J. Epinesa developed so much that he only has to play 35% of the snap by the end of the year. But now we have that luxury. When you cut him, you're now putting all your eggs in your basket that either a rookie or a seventh round pick second year player are ready to play a material amount of snaps, something that matters, something that we need every single game. So I love Thomas Banks point here. Um, the fact that we heard pot consistently positive things about Brian Cox Jr. And Mike Love, they are going to be number one targets for me on the practice yeah. squad. Um, honestly, out of everybody that was cut, they're two of my top choices yeah. of who I want back is, as soon as possible. You can never have a enough defensive line depth. And that's no. a fantastic uh, problem to have. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with you. And there's going to, it's a long season. We saw uh, Jerry Hughes was pretty much playing hurt all year long. And now you have that type of depth where if something like that pops up with any of these guys, I, you feel more confident that you can maybe rest that guy or give him a couple weeks off because you have the depth that you can, you can play a guy that's played 65% of the snaps. You can play another guy that's played 35% of the snaps or bring somebody up from your practice squad that you feel confident can, can come in and take a handful of snaps a game to help you out. So uh, great job. And yeah, I, I think they're going to be top targets yeah. uh, on the practice squad. 
So I found a person saying a nice thing about Sarla Tule, so I put ooh, it ooh. Um, So at defensive tackle, we're keeping – this is made probably the easiest one on the roster. Ed Oliver, Quentin Jefferson, Harrison Phillips, Vernon Butler, locked in stone for a long time here. There were a couple people throwing it out there that maybe Vincent Taylor could make a run, that they like Tanzo Smart. I think they're both, again, right there with Mike Love and, and Brian Cox, pri- uh, priority practice squad guys. I like having that depth there. I don't think either of them are on par with the four guys who are playing here. And again – you know, Ed Oliver is easy as the stud leader of this defensive line from a talent standpoint. But then I love it that I don't really know who's next out of Quentin Jefferson and Harrison Phillips and Vernon Butler and their versatility and what they're good at. And um, I, I do think uh, Gregory Man 11 here makes a decent point in that I don't know that we have an obvious one tech guy that that's their strength. I think that Harrison Phillips has the best shot at it. I actually think that Vernon Butler is similar to Jordan Phillips and where his body looks like a one tech, but he plays like a three tech. Um, so we'll see where that goes. And I don't hate that we have more penetrating attacking guys in that. Hopefully the overall depth on the defensive line allows the linebackers to flow and allows those things to come along better where we don't need that guy just to hold the point. And that when we do need it, it can be Harrison Phillips, but I thought D tackle was a pretty clean one. Yeah. I can't wait to see some of the stunts that they're going to run and the rotations that they can run. We were just talking about the rotations at end. And then you, you throw in these guys here in the interior and they can get outside. They can move. It's going to be chaos for opposing offensive lines and quarterbacks to see where guys are coming from and who's going to be able to get blocked. Uh, I can't wait to see it. I, I think, I do think defensive tackle is probably the easiest position. One of the easier positions here on this team to just, when I saw that, it made total sense. And, and yeah, I'm fine with bringing a Vincent Taylor back. He, he doesn't do a whole lot for me. I, I wasn't crazy about what I saw out of him last year, but if he's a guy in the practice squad, I think he's a upper tier practice squad. I, bottom of the rocker in the NFL. I'd love to have him back. Great question from our friend Joe Marino. It, what do you think the plan would be if Star didn't opt out? I think it would have been nine defensive linemen still. I think Quentin Jefferson would have counted more as a defensive end, and it would have been Trent Murphy or Daryl Johnson. And I think with adding Star's money back in, it might have been the tipping point for Trent Murphy. I think if you still kept Star there, that could have been just enough. I'd like to think that it would have been Daryl Johnson and they would have gone with that. But if Star's money was added back into this year, I think it might have been the tipping point to be Trent Murphy. But I think it still would have been nine defensive linemen and Quentin Jefferson would have been more DN than D-tackle. Yeah, the football decision would have been easy. It would have been Daryl Johnson's not on this team, and you go Trevor. But yeah, I, I can see the the money being the tipping point there. But um, we don't have to worry about that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so all right, now that we get into the next one, I took my victory lap on projecting the Trey White, and I picked Trent Murphy. Here's where I'm going to take an take L. Take your L take because <laughs> um, everyone took an L. Here. Yesterday, uh, Corey Thompson and Voshan Joseph got announced as cutting it. Then early on in the day, Andre Smith got. Uh, projected to get cut which I, I had him on the roster when they traded for him i thought that was the i thought it was a lock that once you had Corey thompson and Voshan joseph get released and we traded for him that hey this is a guy that we want for special teams and then he got announced to be cut and then i'm like okay well this is easy we have five there's, linebackers. there's no other guys left tremaine edmonds matt milano aj klein terrell dodson tyler medikevich and i will give uh, our man ron uh, who is I am legend on Twitter. You guys should follow him said, Hey, you forgot about Delshawn Phillips. And I was like, no, I didn't. <laughs> no, I'm just making that up. <laughs> not even a real person. You're making up that name. Delshawn Phillips. God bless him. Man. The man made the opening roster easily. The biggest surprise of the day. Um, I, you know, could you have anything to add on, on the background and history of your knowledge of Delshawn Phillips? I'm still not even sure who he is. I definitely couldn't pick him out of a lineup. Uh, yeah, no, I, I pride myself on like being pretty well versed on yeah. who's on this team for, for years. Didn't know. So I heard the name come up. I had to Google him. They had no idea who he was. So good on him. And I do love a story like this though. Of, and I think it also goes back to what we were talking about with Trey white of some of the t- things that signal things to the locker room. And I don't know what happened because we didn't have access to any of the film. And I, if anyone says they saw Delshawn Phillips doing anything or any reports of them, they're lying to you. They're not telling the truth at all. They're total liars that nobody saw this coming. Um, because we didn't have enough access to Cam. Maybe some of the beat guys that weren't able to report on this probably maybe had seen something. Maybe. But maybe. Uh, 
I'm sure within the team, guys are really happy for yes. him because I, I if, if you're a no name like that and no fans know about you, the, to get on the 53 means you worked your ass off this summer and you showed somebody something. And I think that this means a lot that a guy like that can get on the team and, and make, get himself a, a spot on the 53. And, and that speaks volumes in the locker room, I think, is yeah. that whoever works for it and proves it, doesn't matter what your name is. Doesn't matter where you come from. We're going to give you a spot on this roster. So good for him, man. I love a good story like this. Absolutely, and honestly, it speaks to Heath Farwell's influence here, and that he wants the guys who are going to contribute. And if you want to be that last linebacker, it's because you're going to bust your ass on special teams. Yep. He is a six-two, two hundred twenty-nine pound linebacker, real similar to that Matt Milano linebacker safety hybrid. He's twenty-three, uh, as our man Joe uh, had said here. He coming out of the the University of Illinois, fighting the line eye. Um, just a guy that it's a great message to the locker room. I, you know, I don't want to be cold i want to celebrate what's there he is the kind of guy that if they make a claim he he could get bumped to the practice squad but it's awesome i I think it's a great message when you have a roster this deep for somebody to be able to make a run at this roster that means something you make this roster this 53 with some of the other guys we rattled off that got cut you're doing something right and you know god bless them that's fantastic really excited for that and and i think it's, it's fun to be able to see absolutely um for the next one, and uh, for our, our sponsors, Uncle Jumbo's, I wanted to make Delshawn Phillips the uh, Uncle Jumbo's player spotlight of the week because, you know, I, it's just fantastic to be able to see there. And he is going to pour himself a nice glass of Uncle Jumbo's That's tonight. Maybe the and only award he wins this yeah. year is the Uncle Jumbo's <laughs> spotlight player of the week. Oh, <laughs> uh, But, yeah, he earned it. Hey, you make yeah. this roster. You Absolutely. Did you did something right. Um, so it's something where I, I'm a little – I'm a little surprised at this next one, um, only because of the numbers. So yeah. at cornerback, Tredavious White, Taron Johnson, Levi Wallace, Josh Norman, Saran Neal, they listed cornerback, um, all easy ones. But the, everyone was debating, is it going to be Dane Jackson or Cam Lewis or Brian Allen? And it ended up being none of them. Uh, I'll say that was a mild surprise to me. I was a little surprised. I'm uh, always pounding the table for the more cornerbacks the better in this league teams are spreading you out uh you have to have guys ready to go um I, I would like to see another body i really thought it was gonna be cam phillips again we didn't get a lot of insider access to training camp no fans did but some of the reports and and you saw it in some of the highlight videos this guy was flying around he was making plays and dane jackson didn't seem to really take any type of foothold in that competition for that spot. So, uh, you know, you said some of the, your top guys to bring back on the practice squad. Kim Phillips is one for me. I, I definitely want to see him back on the practice squad because you're going to need to pull a guy up at some point this year. You got an older guy in Josh Norman, who's already been dealing with a hamstring injury. You got Levi Wallace now dealing with a hamstring. We don't know how severe those are. Norman's coming back. Those types of things can linger a little bit, but you're going to run into injuries. They talked about it all week this week with Sierra Neal asking if he can play outside or where he can play. Yeah, he's going to get some playing time this year because you're going to deal with injuries. You're going to have spots where you need to rotate guys, keep guys fresh. So I would love to see uh, a couple of those guys come back and be on the practice squad because you need them. And I think that's a good problem to have. I, I would like to see the local kid though on this yeah. roster. I think that's another good story to see. So hopefully he'll get, he'll get some time and get on this roster, but I'm going to say right now, I'm a huge Sear Neal stand and I'll get on my little soapbox here for a second. We talk about Josh Allen and where he came from playing at Wyoming. Sear Neal played at Jacksonville state college. I didn't even know that was a real thing until we drafted him. Uh, he played everywhere there. He has taken some time uh, to become the player he is. And we talk about Josh Allen's development saying, Hey, this is going to take a little bit of time. Year three is going to be a big year for Sierra Neal. I loved what I saw from him when he did play. Obviously, everybody's going to remember the missed sack and the dropped interception in the Texas games. But I'll tell you right now, he missed that sack. That was a hell of a blitz yeah. by Sierra Neal. That, that, in a critical play. He did what he was supposed to do. He didn't, he didn't finish the play, but that was a fantastic play by him. He shot out of there. He pulled the trigger. He, he, he's close. He's close to being a really good player. I think he can be a special athlete if he takes the next step. He can be a really nice special piece for this team. So, 
I'm expecting big things out of Siren Neal this year. And I think he's going to be a lot more in that rotation than people think. He, he's a guy that can play inside outside. So he's a big versatility piece uh, for Sean McDermott. Taron Johnson's a big question mark. Can he stay healthy? And, and Siren Neal gives you a little bit of comfort that if that yeah. does happen, you got a guy that can play inside outside. So I'm a big fan of him and I'm expecting big things, but we can go on with the rest of the roster. I just want to stand a little bit for Siren <laughs> Neal here tonight. No, I think he deserves it. And I think he's another player that we might see a step forward uh, from that kind of guy. So, um, the next one again was a, probably a fairly easy one, although it did seem, you know, sneaky at the moment. So Micah High, Jordan Poyer, Jaquan Johnson had technically made the roster. It's already been announced that Dean Marlowe is going to be signing back. So, um, I was a little surprised at first when Dean Marlowe was announced as being cut, but I, I kind of figured that kind of thing was coming. I Dean Marlowe's never cut. cut. <laughs> <laughs> Dean Marlowe is the roster cockroach. It's yeah. impossible to kill him. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's fantastic to be able to have them back here, and that's an easy one to be able to bring back in. Um, the specialist, there was no surprise. It was already announced. So, obviously, oh. Tyler Bass, Corey oh. is Reed Ferguson. And that is your 2020 Buffalo Bills roster. And, and For today. I, for today, I think that's the the key to be able to think about is that it really is just the initial 53-man roster. There's going to be changes. We saw these changes last year. Um, I think that one, John Feliciano is the easy one. There's a second IR coming that we don't know about. So I, I you know, guessed at, you know, some kind of tongue in cheek with Jake Fromm, but it could be something like that. Um, I hope it's not Levi Wallace. That's the only one that I can think of that would be more legitimate from an injury standpoint um so we'll see where that one goes so i'll put you on the spot here aaron what was your most surprising cut out of the guys who who didn't make the roster (sighs) that's gonna be a tough one for me i would have to say (sighs) you are putting me on the spot a little bit here obviously the the surprises are the ones that are coming back sure uh, but i mean cam phillips cam phillips is probably cam lewis or cam lewis sorry cam lewis is probably the most surprising one for me just because I'd like the numbers there and he did uh, make plays in camp. You kept hearing about him making plays and, and standing out. So I thought that maybe they would, they would go with more cornerback. So yeah, that's probably my surprise, but again, not a, not a massive surprise. No, yeah. Nothing really crazy. Yeah. So for the six minutes before the news was clarified, Andre Roberts would have been mined with a bullet um, that I was shocked and confused <laughs> by. Um, so the fact that that got clarified took that off. And I think you're right. I did have Jane, Dane Jackson making it over Cam Lewis, but that cornerback market not having a sixth guy there would be my most surprising cut. I will. We won't give a second nod to our uncle Jumbo's spotlight player of the game um, or uh, spotlight player with Delshawn Phillips, who obviously was the most surprising roster spot. I'm going to say my runner up was Jake Fromm. Uh, I just, I didn't hear anything positive. And you know, you say this all the time that we hear only what we're supposed to hear out of what's coming out of one bills drive and that they're not sharing anything that they don't want shared and that we didn't actually see any of the players here. And I bought in hook, line and sinker to the comments that were coming out from the beat reporters and the people there and all the people that, that we know of that were, you know, being able to, to say how poorly he was playing. I'm genuinely surprised that he got a roster spot here. Yeah, for me, it's a coin flip between a, as confident as I pretended to be about Trent Murphy. I was <laughs> pretty sure that money might play the role, and I, I just hate that for that to happen. So Trent Murphy might be one, but yeah, no, you're right. I think I, oh, as 99% convinced that Fromm would not be on yeah. this. I didn't think they were keeping three quarterbacks. I'm yeah. not going to lie. I thought yeah. it was just going to be Allen and Barkley, and they were going to roll with that, and whichever one they could claim off you know, waivers would come back between Fromm and Webb and they'd be happy to just get one of those guys back. So to keep the three, maybe it's a COVID thing. Maybe you're right. Maybe they're just going to say, Hey, from we're going to Nancy Kerrigan you here for <laughs> uh, an afternoon here. And you got an injury all of a sudden uh, you could be right. But yeah, I don't expect them to be active really at any point this year, but so, so pretty interesting that they kept him around. Yeah. Yeah. But, Brandon, why does Dan Morgan have a bat in the corner? This is you. Um, so uh, we had a couple of questions. Big Tim was asking, is Sweeney going to be that second guy? They don't need to do that. Uh, a good answer here from Warcode. Um, because he never passed his physical right. and never practiced in training camp, they get to just carry him over for free. We lose him for six weeks instead of three weeks, but that is accurate. Um, so we'll see uh, where that one comes from. The, the final things that we'll kind of talk through here is what to expect next. And that I'm... I'm going to say I don't expect a lot of moves. I don't expect a mystery signing. I don't expect a 
you know, twenty third hour uh, Jadavian Clowney signing or some crazy trade or anything fun. I won't be shocked if there's some fifty third man shuffling for a, a claim. I, I hope it doesn't, you know, knock out our man Delshawn Phillips. But it's that kind of thing that you, where you would see that. I wouldn't be shocked if you see some dabbling at the edge of the roster. I am a little confused who that second IR spot is. That's going to be genuine news when that one comes out. Um, but we'll see where those kind of things come from. You could see, I think we're a little light in the secondary, so I wouldn't be shocked at a claim there. Uh, Joe Smith bringing up here, Razul Douglas, who is a player that a lot of people liked. Um, there was also another corner, uh, Sidney Jones, that was uh, from Philadelphia that people liked. Um, so we'll see where those things come from. But do you expect any big moves or anything surprising here? I don't. I really don't. I think, like you said, shuffling the deck at the bottom of the roster, maybe a little bit tweaking that. Uh, but I, I think you're going into Monday morning fully ready for the, this roster going for the Jets. I, I do think it's a little bit to do with COVID-19 and, and that and not have wanted to deal with bringing guys in. And there just aren't a lot of guys. Yeah, maybe Russell Douglas. I, I know that he's done well in zone. Uh, maybe bring him in, but he doesn't move the needle for me. I'd rather just bring Cam Lewis back into the fold if you feel like you need another guy i think you can shift some pieces around and and get him in on the roster uh so no i don't see anything happen i think we've moved past this point they feel pretty good get that trey white deal done we're on to the jets it's jets time it's jets week uh and that's where things are at at one bills drive so Alexander Strong making a comment here. Watch 15 minutes after the stream ends. Of the <laughs> of Buffalo. Now, I, I, will say, I don't expect Adrian Peterson to be the guy, but I, I'd be naive to think that running back isn't a spot they'd consider upgrading from Yeldon. I don't think it's a priority, but if they thought, I know people threw out Lamar Miller, people threw out some of the other guys who, who got cut here. If you saw a team cut somebody that they thought was a surprise, that's not a shocking one. I, I think that's more likely than some of the other spots. I don't think there's room for a receiver. I don't think there's room for a tight end. I don't think there's room for a defensive lineman. It would be a sixth linebacker. It would be a tenth safe uh, secondary guy. It would be a running back. Um, you never know offensive line. That that one's tough to know if they have their eye on somebody out there. But running backs on the list, it's certainly an opportunity there. So I, I don't think it's going to be Adrian Peterson, but uh, it's certainly a, a possibility. Yeah, no, and that, that's crazy to be going into week one and looking at your roster and saying third Running back is where I would like sure. to see an upgrade. I, I can't remember the last time. <laughs> I just rattled off five position groups where there's no possibility to sign anybody because we're already so good. How yeah. crazy is that? That you didn't even call me crazy when I rattled that off. And the, yeah, yeah, that's about. And right. I look for every opportunity to say that you're wrong. <laughs> I want everyone to know that I'm looking and, and waiting for my spot. But you're, you you hit the money. It's a it's a very good, well rounded roster. And so yeah, if we can upgrade running back number three, sure. If not, I'm I'm fine with y'all then being the third running back too so now one of my favorite segments is that everyone knows aaron has found his place of peace to focus and meditate each morning and part of that was leaving the world of social media and that you know i don't want him to miss out completely i'm glad that he's got his head in the right space and has come back to us here on the show but that i still want to make sure he realizes why he wants to stay away from twitter and this week there was not just one tweet there was a series of tweets some of them put on by some of our fellow content creators in the the bills media space people were talking about trading john brown and they were oh, serious boy. yeah not, I saw some of that. not next year not in the future because gabe davis has a great season like right now they thought they were going to trade him today that's crazy <laughs> what are it's you- bait no that was bait people were people were driving clicks that's all that is. I'm not even going to tolerate that kind of nonsense. That's why that honestly, I'll tell you right now, you bastards in the Slack channel, <laughs> put that, send that stuff into my existence. And that is the stuff that I'm so happy that I'm not on Twitter anymore. Cause I can't help myself for, for just yelling at people like that. Don't put that nonsense out there. This team has worked so hard to put weapons around Josh Allen and round out that wide receiver room. You guys are absolutely insane to think that they would get rid of John Brown. He, oh my God, he was the favorite target of Josh Allen. He's probably going to benefit most from Stefan Diggs being on this roster. You're insane to want to get rid of that for measly future picks. And it, it's about 2020 folks. Yes. We're, we're in it to win it. Well, and a guy who's willing to be selfless 
and team centered yes. and yes. focused on what's best for the team. He's not going to complain about targets. He's not going to complain about not getting touches. He wants to win and he wants to be a valuable piece of the team. That's the perfect guy you want taking this step from wide receiver one to wide receiver two. And for all the people who are ecstatic about Gabe Davis, I'm excited about the hype train too. It sounds fun. We have no idea. You people saw eight single play highlights and a bunch of people saying, oh, he looked good. We have no idea what he's ready for. We have no idea what his route tree looks like, the nuance of what he's capable of. I hope it means we got a steal in the fourth round, just like Stefan Diggs was a steal in the fifth round, and that he becomes something great. We're not ready to get rid of John Brown. Tell anyone who says that to do something inappropriate. The biggest oh. problem I want to have in my life is that Josh Allen has too many weapons where we're trying to find ways <laughs> to get guys on the field. That's the problem yes. that, I, that I need in my life. I want that so bad, but I, I'm people got to pump the brakes a little bit on, on Davis. I, I agree with you. We haven't seen much. We've seen what the team wants us to see. We've heard good reports. I'm excited that he does look good. Sure. I hope that it works out. I know John Brown is good at football yeah. and I know that Josh Allen likes him. And Josh Allen was raving about him in the press conference, almost essentially saying that he learned what it was like to be a pro from being with John Brown last year. And that attention to detail, you don't get rid of a person like that. You guys are all nonsense. Whoever said that but blasphemy, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ahmed Joe Marino giving a very nice runner up. I saw this one too. The Jets fan who thinks that they're going 11 and 5 was the worst thing Joe saw on Twitter. I don't get me wrong. Surprises happen every year. That is the most dysfunctional franchise in football right now. I think at least the Jaguars have a direction. They know what they're doing. They're cutting bait, they're collecting assets, they're moving on. I don't know what the Jets are thinking and the injury bug has hit them and they've had all kinds of issues. You'll hear my prediction next week on Wednesday. We're going to have our friend Connor Rogers on from Bleacher Report to preview the uh, week one game here. Uh, Also to throw in a quick uh, chime, uh, Eric Turner and Russ Brown are going to be doing an awesome matchup show. I can't wait for that. It's going to be fantastic. Detailed video breakdown going through them. We're going to see that series coming up this year. Check it out for the cover one matchup show. But yeah, for Joe's, uh, worst, you know, thing on Twitter. I saw that too, and and it's sad. I, I think that it's going to get ugly for the Jets. I ignore Jets fans, man. There's that gif of a couple old guys <laughs> humping bags of trash. That is Jets fans sitting there thinking they. Uh, <laughs> it's got to be the air in New Jersey. There's something yeah. wrong with Jets fans. It, at least Bills fans, we get a little bit crazy. We take the bait on every PFF yeah. tweet, but I think more times than not, when we've had mediocre to bad teams, we know it. You know, we're not totally out of whack with where we're at. I feel like every single year Jets fans feel like they're about to win the Super Bowl. They're nuts. I don't even listen to Jets fans. <laughs> so uh, something we're really excited about, again, mentioned that uh, that the film room is coming up from Eric and Russ. It's going to be a really awesome breakdown going throughout the season. Uh, some fun things, checking out the, the potential weaknesses, opportunities that the bills offense and defense will go through. Each of them will pick a target on offense or defense, go into detail, break it down on film, show you everything that's there. So that's going to be coming up here and dropping very soon. Aaron, what are you most excited about with what happened today? I am excited with the, the part that we talked about the depth of this team and and especially along that defensive lines, the, the things that they're going to be able to do and what that's going to do for Tremaine Edmonds and Matt Milano and opening those guys up a little bit. I'm just, I'm so excited to see how that works. I I said it earlier. I get really nervous. The idea of having a top tier defense three years in a row, I'm going to knock on wood, but I'm pretty confident that this unit of all units is going to be able to just maintain that level of excellence, true excellence. And a lot of it has to do with that front seven and, uh, and what they're going to be able to do up front. You, you hear me talk about it all the time. We win at the line of scrimmage. And I, I, a big part of that is, and I hate to, to, to my horns, bringing Trent Murphy back. I think having that type of depth that a guy where you didn't have to cut him, and you're still probably, you still sign Trey white and luxury. You're still, it's a luxury. It's a luxury now. You have a, a luxurious line of veteran guys who are, they're all bought into the process. They're all process pounders. And, and I can't wait to see how they use them. I'm so excited you said process pounders. <laughs> <laughs> Just the, the fact that today was a great day. 
the, yeah. that we got to celebrate Trey White's extension and that we get to argue over which really good player was on the roster and that we weren't having to, you know, constantly debate him. Who the heck is that guy? Why are we keeping that many of this? It's so fantastic that we have these problems and that Sean McDermott and Brandon Bean have turned this franchise around to give Bills fans excitement and something to genuinely buy into. And I keep telling people over and over again, I get it. I'm from the same place as you are. I've been born and raised watching this team just like you guys have. I get the idea of I'll believe it when I see it. I get the idea of eh, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not going to open my heart and let them you know, break it again. Buy in. Lean into this team now. This is going to be a good season. Good things are going to happen. I don't know if we win the Super Bowl. I don't know if we make some crazy run at the end. There's going to be fun football to watch. They're going to win more games than they lose. They're going to be in every single game, and this is going to be a fun season. It's going to be a great time to be a Bills fan, and I'm so excited for all you guys listening. This team, I don't think they will beat any team in the league. They can beat any team in the NFL. And I don't know that I can honest. I've said it to my Patriots friends, you know, throughout the years. Oh, we're, we're, we can beat any team. I really believe that this team can go up against teams like the Ravens, can go head to head with teams like the Chiefs. And maybe they nine times out of 10, they, they aren't going to win. But I do think that they can beat those teams. I think they, they can play football with them and they belong on the same football field as those teams. And once you get into the playoffs, man, that's the beauty of the NFL. Anything can happen. So I've never been more excited for football with COVID and everything. I was so worried as a Bills fan that it was all going to come falling down. And the, the one year you get this roster just right, it was all going to come falling down. So Bills fans, this should be a super exciting week for us. Football's kicking off. We just pop some champagne bottles. We're bringing Trey back and, and really getting this roster to put together uh, for a nice, fun run at what could be a really fun season uh, for us. And, and damn it, we deserve it. <laughs> Absolutely. So it, it's really fun. Check out everything we have going on at CoverOne.net. Check us out. You know, if you have fun with the show tonight, if you think that this is going to be a good season, tell your friends about it. Tell them to check us out. Come listen to the show. Give us a rating. Give us a review. Uh, we've done all kinds of fun giveaways, all kinds of t- fun contests. We're trying to make it engaging for you guys. We brought on this new platform to be able to post comments and answer with you guys live during the show. Tell somebody else about what we have going on. Give us a like. Give us a rating. Give us a review. That's how people find out about us. Really excited excited here i love having aaron quinn back right alongside me to be able to go through this season it's going to be so much fun but you have been listening to cover one buffalo and we are out 